Learn how to set your goals. There are four important things to keep in mind. A. Write down your goal. You will then begin to crystallize your thinking. The very act of thinking as you write will have a tendency to create an indelible impression in your memory. B. Give yourself a deadline. Specify a time for achieving your objective. This is important in motivating you. Set out in the direction of your goal and keep moving toward it. C. Set your standards high. Now there seems to be a direct relationship between ease in achieving a goal and the strength of your motives. You have discovered for yourself in Chapter 9 how to motivate yourself at will, and in Chapter 10, how to motivate others. And the higher you set your major goal, generally speaking, the more concentrated will be the effort you make to achieve it. The reason? Logic will make it mandatory that you at least aim at an intermediate objective as well as an immediate one. So aim higher, and then have immediate and intermediate steps leading toward its achievement. The following question should stimulate your thinking. Where will you be and what will you be doing ten years from today if you keep doing what you are doing now? D. Aim high. It is a peculiar thing that no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand prosperity and abundance, than is required to accept misery and poverty. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening when I counted my scanty store. For life is a just employer. It gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire, only to learn dismayed, that any wage I had asked of life, life would have willingly paid. You have to be bold enough to ask of life more than you may right now feel you are worth because it is an observable fact that people tend to rise to meet demands that are put upon them. While it is exceedingly desirable that you blueprint your program from beginning to end, this is not always feasible. One doesn't always know all the answers between the beginning of a great enterprise or journey and its ending. But if you know where you are and where you want to be, and you start from where you are to get where you want to be, you will. If you keep properly motivated... Move forward step by step until you get there. Take that first step. The important thing after setting a goal is taking action. A 63-year-old grandmother, Mrs. Charles Philippia, decided that she was going to walk from New York City to Miami, Florida. She reached Miami and while there was interviewed by newspaper men. They wanted to know if the idea of such a long journey on foot hadn't frightened her. How did she ever summon courage to make such a journey with her feet as her only mode of travel? It doesn't take courage to take one step, replied Mrs. Philippia. And that's all I did, really. I just took one step, and then I took another step, and then another, and another, and here I am. Yes, you must take that first step. It makes no difference how much thinking and study time you spend. It will avail you little unless you also act. One of the authors was introduced to a man in Phoenix, Arizona by a friend. It was a rather odd introduction. Meet the man who received a million dollars cash for a gold mine and now has the million dollars and also owns the mine. How in the world did you manage such a thing, came the question, asked with considerable awe. Oh, I had an idea, but I didn't have any money. I did have a pick and a shovel, so I took my pick and my shovel and went out to make my idea a reality, he responded. And then it occurred to me, if I would search for a gold mine and dig around the vein, should I find a mine, one of the large mining corporations could afford to work the mine, whereas I wouldn't have the necessary capital. You know, mining machinery costs money today. So I searched for and found a vein of gold. Every indication was that I had made a very rich strike. I sold it for two million dollars. The terms were a million dollars in cash and a first mortgage of a million dollars. While mining operations were underway, the vein ran out. I informed the owners of the mining company that if they wanted to abandon the mine, I would take it back and cancel their mortgage. They accepted. So you see, I got a million dollars cash for the mine 
and still have the million dollars and the mine. Wealth Repelled with NMA A positive mental attitude will attract wealth, but a negative mental attitude will do just the opposite. With a positive mental attitude, you will keep trying until you achieve the wealth you are seeking. Now, you might start with a positive mental attitude and make your first step forward. Yet you may become influenced by the negative side of your talisman and stop when you are just one step from reaching your destination. You may fail to employ one of the 17 success principles. Here's a very good example. Let's call our man Oscar. In the latter part of 1929, he was at the railroad station in Oklahoma City where it was necessary for him to wait several hours for a train connection east. He had spent months in the western deserts in temperatures as high as 110 degrees. He was seeking oil for an eastern concern, and he was successful. Oscar was a graduate of MIT. It is said that he had combined the old divining rod, galvanometer, magnetometer, oscillograph, radio tubes, and other instruments into a doodle bug for detecting oil deposits. Now Oscar had received word that the company he represented was insolvent. It had become bankrupt because the president had used the firm's large cash resources in speculation in the stock market. The market crashed in late 1929. Oscar was on his way home. He was out of a job, and the outlook was rather dismal. The influence of NMA began to exert a powerful influence on him. Because he had to wait several hours, he decided to occupy himself by setting up his instrument in the railroad station. The reading on his instrument was so high in its positive indication of oil deposits that Oscar, in a rage, impulsively kicked the instrument and destroyed it. You see, Oscar was frustrated. There couldn't be that much oil. There couldn't be that much oil, he shouted repeatedly in disgust. But Oscar was frustrated. He was under the influence of a negative mental attitude. The opportunity for which he had been searching lay at his very feet. He only had to make one step to reach it. But because of the influence of NMA, he refused to recognize it. He lost faith in his own invention. Had he been under the influence of PMA, he would have attracted wealth, not repelled it. Applied faith is one of the important 17 success principles. The test of your faith is whether you apply it at the time of your greatest need. NMA had led Oscar to believe that many of the things that he had faith in were wrong. As you recall, the Depression brought a fear of consciousness into the minds of many persons. Oscar was one. He had worked hard and sacrificed, yet he was out of a job through no fault of his own. The president of his company had been held in high esteem by Oscar, yet this man whom he trusted embezzled the company's funds. Now the machine that had proved its value in the past seemed to have gone haywire. Yes, Oscar was frustrated. When Oscar boarded the train at the Oklahoma City Railroad Station that day, he left his doodlebug behind, and he also left one of the nation's richest oil deposits. A short time later, Oklahoma City was found to be literally floating on oil. Oscar has become a living demonstration of the application of two principles. A positive mental attitude attracts wealth, and a negative mental attitude repels it. Wealth can be acquired on a modest salary. But you may say, all this about positive and negative mental attitudes is very fine for someone who's out to make a million dollars, but I'm not really interested in making a million. Of course I want security. I want enough to live well and take care of the needs I will have someday when I retire. What about me if I am an office employee? What about me when I have just a fair salary? Now here's our answer. You too can acquire wealth. Wealth enough for security. Or even wealth enough to become rich in spite of what you say. Just let the PMA influence of your talisman affect you favorably. We'll prove that this can be done. And if for some reason you aren't fully convinced, just read a book, The Richest Man in Babylon and then make your first step forward. Keep going, and you'll have the financial security or wealth you are seeking. Now that's exactly what Mr. Osborne did. Mr. Osborne was a salaried employee, yet he acquired wealth. It wasn't so many years ago that he retired with the statement, 
I now spend my time having my money make money for me while I do what I want to do. Again, the principle used by Mr. Osborne is so obvious that it is often unseen. The principle he learned and the one that you also can employ will now be stated in a very few words. In reading The Richest Man in Babylon, Mr. Osborne found that wealth could be acquired if you a. Just save one dime out of every dollar you earn. b. Each six months, invest your savings and interest or dividend returns from these savings and investments. And c. When you invest, seek expert advice on safe investments, and thus you won't gamble and lose your principal. Let us repeat. That's exactly what Mr. Osborne did. Just think of it. You can have security or wealth by saving only a dime out of each dollar you earn and investing it safely. When should you start? Do it now. Now let's contrast Mr. Osborne's experience with that of a man who had good physical health and read an inspirational book. He was 50 years old when he was introduced to Napoleon Hill. This man smiled when he said, I read your book Think and Grow Rich many years ago, but I'm not rich. Napoleon Hill laughed and then replied seriously, But you can be rich. Your future is ahead of you. You must prepare yourself to be ready. And in making yourself ready for the opportunities that are available to you, you must first develop a positive mental attitude. And the interesting thing is that this man did heed the author's advice. Five years later, the man wasn't rich, but he had developed a positive mental attitude, and he was on his way to wealth. He had been many thousands of dollars in debt. Within the five-year period, he had gotten completely out of debt and had begun making investments with the money he had saved. He developed PMA as he studied the book Think and Grow Rich. He did not only read it, he had learned to recognize principles and apply them. When the NMA side of his talisman was influencing him, he was like those workmen who blamed their tools for poor craftsmanship. Have you ever blamed your tools? Where does the fault lie? If you own a perfect camera and use the right film, if you have the proper set of rules to take perfect pictures under all types of circumstances, if someone else takes perfect photographs with your camera but yours are failures, does the fault lie with the camera? Could it be that you have read the rules but haven't taken the time to understand them? Or, if you do understand them, that you don't apply the rules? Could it be that you will listen to Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude, a book that could change the entire course of your life for the better, without taking the time to understand, memorize self-motivators, learn the principles that will guarantee success, and apply them? Your answer will be evident to you by your action. Now it's not too late to learn. If you haven't learned by now, you might as well learn now. You will not succeed consistently unless you know and understand the rules. You will not continuously succeed unless you apply the rules. Therefore, take the time to understand and apply what you are hearing in this book. PMA will help you. The Home of My Dreams Remember, the thought that you think and the statements you make regarding yourself determine your mental attitude. If you have a worthwhile objective, find the one reason why you can achieve it rather than the hundreds of reasons why you can't. One of the rules in obtaining what you want through PMA is to act once you have your sights on a goal. Another is, go the extra mile. W. Clement Stone tells of the following experience which illustrates both rules. One April evening, while I was visiting Frank and Claudia Noonan in Mexico City, Claudia commented, I wish we could have a home in the Jardines del Pedregal de San Angel. This is the most desirable section of that beautiful city. Why don't you, I asked. Frank laughed and answered, We don't have the money. Does that make any difference if you know what you want, I inquired. And then, without waiting for a response, I asked a question that I might ask of you. By the way, have you ever read an inspirational, motivating book like Think and Grow Rich, The Power of Positive Thinking, I Can, I Dare You, TNT, Applied Imagination, Turn on the Green Lights in Your Life, Acres of Diamonds, or 
the magic of believing? No, was the response. Thereupon, I told of several experiences of those persons who knew what they wanted, read an inspirational book, listened to its message, and then got into action. And I even told how years ago I purchased a new $30,000 home on my own terms with a $1,500 down payment, and how in due course it was completely paid for. I promised to send one of the recommended books. I did. Frank and Claudia Noonan were ready. It was the following December, while studying in my library, that I received a telephone call from Claudia, who said, We just arrived from Mexico City, and the first thing Frank and I wish to do is to thank you. Thank me for what? We want to thank you for our new home in the Jardinas del Pedregal de San Angel. A few days later at dinner, Claudia explained, Late one Saturday afternoon, Frank and I were relaxing at home. Some friends from the States telephoned and asked if we could drive them to the Jardinas del Pedregal de San Angel. It just so happened we were both rather exhausted, and besides, we had taken them there earlier in the week. Frank was ready to beg off when an expression used in the book flashed through his mind, Go the Extra Mile. While driving them through this man-made paradise, I saw the home of my dreams, even the swimming pool I longed for. Claudia is the swimming champion Claudia Eckert. Frank bought it. Frank said, You might like to know that although the property cost in excess of a half a million pesos, I only made a deposit of 5,000 pesos. It costs less for our family to live in the Jardinas del Pedregal de San Angel than in our former home. Why is this? I asked in surprise. Well, we bought the two homes that were on the property instead of one. The rent from the one house is enough to make payments on the entire enterprise. Now this wasn't so surprising after all. It's quite common for a family to buy a duplex apartment and rent one and live in the other. What is surprising to a person without experience is how easy it is to get what you want by understanding and applying the success principles to be found in an autobiography or self-improvement book. Attract wealth with PMA, we say. You say, money makes money, and I have no money. This is a negative mental attitude. If you don't have money, use OPM. That's what the next chapter is all about. Pilot number 12. Thoughts to steer by. 1. If you know your specific destination and take the first step, you're on your way. 2. The test of your faith is whether you apply it when you are not in difficulty as well as at the time of your greatest need. 3. If you don't succeed when you finally listen to and study success through a positive mental attitude, with whom does the fault lie? 4. The house of your dreams. You can have it. Like Frank and Claudia Noonan, you may buy two houses and rent one to pay for both. 5. Do you need to be in an accident or get sick and land in a hospital to establish the habit of regularly engaging in study, thinking, and planning time regarding your personal, family, or business life? 6. Have you made a start toward achieving desirable goals by A. Writing down each goal B. Setting deadlines for reaching them C. Setting high goals and D. Inspecting your written statements daily 7. Where will you be and what will you be doing ten years from today if you keep on doing what you are doing now? 8. The Richest Man in Babylon This book gives you a proven formula of success. A. Just save one dime out of every dollar you earn. B. Each six months, invest your savings and the interest or dividend returns from these savings and investments. C. Before you invest, seek expert advice on safe investments. D. If you need the money you are saving for living expenses or necessities, then work an extra hour or more so that you have no excuse for not saving 10% of your earnings. Engage in studying, thinking, and planning time with PMA. Chapter 13. If you don't have money, use OPM. Business? 
It is quite simple. It is other people's money, said Alexander Dumas the Younger in his play, The Question of Money. Yes, it's that simple. Use OPM, other people's money. That's the way to acquire great wealth. Benjamin Franklin did it. William Nickerson did it. Conrad Hilton did it. Henry J. Kaiser did it. Colonel Sanders did it. And Ray Kroc did it. And if you are wealthy, the chances are you did it too. Now, if you are not wealthy, learn to read what is unwritten. In fact, rich or poor, read what is unwritten into every platitude, axiom, or self-motivator. The basic unwritten premise in Use OPM is that you will operate on the highest ethical standards of integrity, honor, honesty, loyalty, consent, and the golden rule, and apply these in your business relationships. The dishonest man is not entitled to credit. And the self-motivator, use OPM, implies repayment in full as agreed with an advantageous consideration or profit to those whose money is used. Credit and the use of OPM are one and the same thing. It is the lack of a satisfactory credit system within a country that keeps backward nations back, whereas it is the credit system as practiced in the United States that has developed such great wealth and progress in this nation. It has been singularly American. Now, the person, corporation, or nation that does not have credit or does not use it for expansion and progress if they do have it is missing an important number in the combination for success. Therefore, take the advice of a wise and successful businessman like Benjamin Franklin. Good Advice Advice to a Young Tradesman, written in 1748 by Franklin, discusses the use of OPM as follows. Remember that money is of the prolific generating nature. Money can beget money, and its offspring can beget more, and so on. Also, Franklin said, Remember that six pounds a year is but a groat a day. For this little sum, which may be daily wasted either in time or expense unperceived, a man of credit may, on his own security, have the constant possession and use of an hundred pounds. Now this statement of Franklin's is a symbol of an idea. His advice is as good today as when it was written. You can start with a few cents and have constant possession of five hundred dollars by employing it. Or, you can expand the idea and have constant possession of millions of dollars. That is what Conrad Hilton does. He is a man of credit. The Hilton Hotels Corporation obtained credit of millions of dollars to build luxurious motels for air travelers at large airports. The corporation's collateral, mostly, Hilton's name for honest dealing. Honesty is one thing for which a satisfactory substitute has never been found. It is something which reaches deeper into a human being than most traits of personality. Honesty, or the lack of it, writes itself indelibly into every word one speaks, into every thought and deed, and often reflects itself in one's face, so that the most casual observer can sense the quality of sincerity immediately. The dishonest person, on the other hand, may announce his weakness in the very tone of his voice, the expression on his face in the nature and trend of his conversations, or in the type of service he renders. So while this chapter might seem to be one about the use of other people's money, it also has strong overtones about character in it. Honesty and reputation, credit and success in business are all intermixed. The man who has the first of them is well on his way to gaining the other three. Make Investments with OPM William Nickerson was another man of credit and reputation who found money can beget money and its offspring can beget more, and so on. He tells about it in his book. The title tells what he did. The book tells how he did it. Nickerson's book is aimed specifically at how to make money with OPM in your spare time in the real estate field. But almost everything he has to say also applies to you in your efforts to acquire wealth by making investments with OPM. How I Turned $1,000 into $3 million in My Spare Time is the title of the book. Show me a millionaire, he says, and I will show you almost invariably a heavy borrower. 
To back up his statement, he points to wealthy men such as Henry Kaiser, Henry Ford, and Walt Disney. And we will point to Charlie Sammons, who, with bank credit, developed a $40 million business in 10 years. But before we do, let's talk about the people who help men like Conrad Hilton, William Nickerson, and Charlie Sammons by loaning them the money they need. Your banker is your friend. Banks are in business to loan money. The more they loan to honest men, the more money they make for themselves. Commercial banks loan money primarily for business purposes. Thus, loans for luxuries are not encouraged. Your banker is an expert, and more important, he is your friend. He wants to help you, for he is one of the people eager to see you succeed. If the banker knows his business, listen to what he has to say. For a person with common sense never underestimates the power of a borrowed dollar or the advice of an expert. It was the use of OPM and a successful plan, plus the PMA success principles of initiative, courage, and common sense that resulted in an average American boy named Charlie Sammons becoming wealthy. Like some Texans, Charlie Sammons of Dallas is a millionaire. In fact, like some other Texans, he is a multimillionaire. Yet at the age of 19, he was no better off financially than most teenage boys, except that he had worked and saved some money. One of the officers in the bank, where Charlie regularly deposited his savings each Saturday, took an interest in him. For the banker felt, now here's a boy of character and ability, and he knows the value of money. So when Charlie decided to go in business for himself, buying and selling cotton, the banker gave him credit. And this was the first experience Charlie Sammons had in the use of OPM. As you will see, it was not the last. He learned then, and has seen it confirmed since, your banker is your friend. About a year and a half after he became a cotton broker, the young man became a horse and mule trader. It was then that he learned much about human nature. And his understanding of people, in addition to his knowledge of money, soon developed in Charlie Sammons a very sound philosophy of a brand commonly observed in persons who are or will be successful. Charlie learned this philosophy at an early age. He has never lost it. Today, he still maintains it. This brand of philosophy is known as common sense. After he had operated a few years as a horse and mule trader, two men came to Charlie and asked him to go to work for them. These two men had developed a reputation for themselves as being outstandingly successful in the sale of insurance. They had come to Charlie because they had learned a lesson from defeat. Here's how it happened. It seems that after these two salesmen had successfully sold life insurance over a period of many years, they were motivated to form a company of their own. They were good salesmen, all right, but they were poor business administrators. In fact, they were such good salesmen that they sold their company out of business. Now, it is not uncommon for salesmen to assume that financial success in a business is contingent only on sales. But this is a false premise. A poor administration can lose money as fast or faster than a good sales management and sales force can bring it in. Their trouble was that neither one of these men was a good administrator. But they had learned their lesson the hard way. On the day they went to see Charlie, one of the salesmen told their story of defeat and said, Since our company went broke, we have paid off our losses from the commissions we have since made selling insurance. We also had to pay for our living. It has taken a mighty long time, but we have done it. We know we are good salesmen, and we also know now that we should keep to our own specialty, selling. He hesitated, looked into the eyes of the young man, and continued. Charlie, you have your feet on the ground. You have good common horse sense and we need you. Together we can succeed. And they did. A plan and OPM developed a $40 million volume. A few years later, Charlie Sammons bought all of the shares of the company he and these two men had formed. How did he get the money? He used OPM plus what he had saved. Where did he get the large amount of money that he needed? He borrowed it from a bank, of course. Remember, he had learned early that his banker was his friend. 
And then in the year that his company had produced an annual premium volume of almost $400,000, the insurance executive finally found the success formula for rapid expansion that he had long been looking for. He was ready. It was this formula plus OPM that developed a $40 million premium volume in a single year. Sammons had seen that an insurance company in Chicago had successfully developed a sales plan through leads. Now, for many years, sales managers had used what is termed the lead system to promote a new business. And with sufficient good leads, salesmen often earn exceedingly large incomes. Inquiries from individuals who indicate an interest are called leads. These are generally obtained from some form of promotional advertising program. Perhaps you know from experience that with human nature being what it is, many salesmen are timid or afraid to try to sell persons whom they don't know or with whom they have had no previous personal contact or communication. Because of this fear, they waste a lot of time that could be used in selling prospects. But even an ordinary salesman will be motivated to call on as many prospects as he has leads, for he knows that many sales can be made even though he himself may have little sales training or experience when he has furnished good leads. And besides, he has an address and a specific person to see there. He believes the prospect is somewhat interested before he interviews him. Therefore, he is not as fearful as he would be if he were forced to try to sell a person without any preconditioning whatsoever. Some companies build their entire sales program on such leads, and advertising is used to obtain them. But advertising costs money. Charlie Sammons knew where to go to get the money when he had a good bankable idea. The Republic National Bank of Dallas for it is well known in Texas that this bank helped build Texas. And it is in the business to lend money to men of integrity like Charlie Sammons, who have a plan and know how to work it. Now, while it is true that some bankers won't take the time to learn their client's business, Oren Kite and other officers of the Republic National do. Charlie explained his plan to them, and as a result, he was able to employ unlimited credit to build his insurance business through the lead system. You see, it was because of the American credit system that Charlie Sammons was able to build the Reserve Life Insurance Company. And under such a system, he was able to develop a premium volume from $400,000 to over $40 million within the short space of 10 years. Again, because he used OPM in his investments, he is able to invest and own controlling interest in hotels, office buildings, manufacturing plants, and other enterprises. But you don't need to go to Texas to use OPM. W. Clement Stone bought an insurance company with $1,600,000 in assets using the seller's own money. He went to Baltimore. How W. Clement Stone bought a $1,600,000 company with the seller's own money. This is how he describes the purchase. It was the year end, and I was engaging in study, thinking, and planning time. I determined that my major objective for the following year would be to own an insurance company that was licensed to operate in several states. I set a deadline as to when this was to be accomplished, December 31st of the next year. Now I knew what I wanted, and a date was set for its achievement, but I didn't know how I could get it. This wasn't really important, for I believed that I could find a way. Therefore, I must, I thought, look for a company that would fulfill my requirements. 1. That it have a charter to sell accident and health insurance. And 2. That it be licensed to operate in nearly all the states. I didn't need established business, just a vehicle. Of course, there was the problem of money, but I would face that problem when it arose. Even then, it occurred to me that I was a salesman by vocation and therefore I could, if it should become necessary, work out a three-way deal. A contract to buy the company, reinsure the entire business with some large company, and thus own everything but the insurance in force. These other insurance companies were willing to pay a good price for established business. I didn't need established business. 
I had the experience and ability to build an accident and health business as long as I had the vehicle. I had already proved this by building a national insurance sales organization. And then I made the next step. I asked for divine guidance and help. While analyzing the immediate problems with which I might be faced, it occurred to me that I should let the world know what I wanted, and the world would help me. Now this conclusion was not in conflict with the principles laid down by Napoleon Hill in Think and Grow Rich, wherein he states that you keep your definite objectives a secret except to members of your mastermind alliance. When I found the company that I wished to buy, I would, of course, follow his suggestion and keep the negotiations a secret from the world until I closed the deal. So I let the world know what I wanted. Every time I met a person in the industry who might give me information, I told him what I was looking for. Joe Gibson of Excess Insurance was such a person. I had met him on just one occasion. The new year was started with enthusiasm, as I had a big objective and I set out to reach it. One month passed. Two. Six months passed. At last, ten months had gone by, and although I had checked into many possibilities, none fulfilled my two basic requirements. Then, one Saturday in the month of October, when I was seated at my desk with my papers pushed back, engaged in study, planning, thinking time, I checked off the list of my objectives for the year. All had been achieved but one, the important one. Just two months to go, I said to myself. There is a way. While I don't know what it is, I know I'll find it. For it never occurred to me that my aim could not be reached, or that it wouldn't be reached within the time limit specified. There is always a way, I said to myself. Again, as on similar occasions, I asked for divine guidance and help. Now two days later, something unexpected happened. I was again seated at my desk. This time I was busy dictating. The telephone rang a disturbing note at my elbow. I picked up the receiver and a voice said, Hello, Clem. This is Joe Gibson. Our conversation was short and I will never forget it. Joe talked rapidly. I thought you would be interested in knowing that the commercial credit company of Baltimore will probably liquidate the Pennsylvania Casualty Company because of its tremendous losses. Of course you know commercial credit owns Pennsylvania Casualty. There will be a meeting of the board of directors next Thursday in Baltimore. All the Pennsylvania Casualty Company's business is already being reinsured by two other insurance companies owned by Commercial Credit. The name of the executive vice president of Commercial Credit is E. H. Warheim. I thanked Joe Gibson warmly, asked him one or two more questions, and then hung up the phone. After a few minutes of thought, it flashed into my mind that if I could conceive a plan whereby commercial credit company would accomplish its objectives more quickly and with greater certainty than under its proposed plan, it shouldn't be difficult to persuade the directors to accept such a plan. I didn't know Mr. Warheim and therefore was hesitant to call him, but I felt that speed was of the essence, and then two self-motivators forced me to act. Where there is nothing to lose by trying and everything to gain if successful, by all means try. Do it now. And without a second's further hesitation, I picked up the phone and placed a long-distance call to E. H. Warheim in Baltimore. Mr. Warheim, I began with a smile in my voice, I have some good news for you. And then I introduced myself and explained that I had heard of the possible action to be taken regarding the Pennsylvania Casualty Company and that I thought I would be in a position to help them reach their objectives more quickly. Then and there, I made an appointment to see Mr. Warheim and his associates the following day at 2 p.m. in Baltimore. At 2 p.m. the next day, W. Russell Arrington, my attorney and I, met with Mr. Warheim and his associates. Pennsylvania Casualty Company fulfilled my needs. It had a charter permitting it to operate in 35 states. It had no insurance in force as the business had already been reinsured by other companies. By making the sale, Commercial Credit Company accomplished its objectives quickly and with certainty. In addition, they received $25,000 from me for the charter. Now the company had $1,600,000 in liquid assets, negotiable securities, and cash. How did I get the $1,600,000? I used OPM. It happened this way. 
What about the $1,600,000 in assets? Mr. Warheim asked. I was ready for the question and immediately responded. Commercial credit company is in the business of lending money. I will just borrow the $1,600,000 from you. We all laughed, and then I continued. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose. For everything I own will be behind the loan, including the $1,600,000 company that I am now buying. Besides, you are in the business of lending money. And what better security could you have than the pledge of the company you are selling me? In addition, you will receive interest on the loan. What is most important to you is that this way you will solve your problem swiftly and with certainty. When I hesitated, Mr. Warheim asked another very important question. How are you going to repay the loan? And I was ready for that question, too. My response was, I will repay the entire loan in 60 days. You see, I don't need more than a half million dollars to operate an accident and health company in the 35 states in which Pennsylvania Casualty Company is licensed. As the company will be wholly owned by me, all I need to do is to reduce the capital and surplus of Pennsylvania Casualty Company from $1,600,000 to $500,000, which I can then apply to my loan with you. You and I know that a businessman is faced with the matter of income taxes on any transaction involving income or expenditures. But no income tax payments will be required on this transaction for the simple reason that the Pennsylvania Casualty Company has not made profits and no part of the money I receive when I reduce the capital will therefore be from profits. And then another question was asked me. What about your plans to repay the balance of the half million dollars? Again, I was prepared to answer and said, This should be easy. The Pennsylvania Casualty Company has assets consisting only of cash, government bonds, and high-grade securities. I can borrow the half million dollars from the banks with which I have been doing business by pledging my interest in Pennsylvania Casualty Company and my other assets as additional security to back the loan. When Mr. Arrington and I left the office of Commercial Credit Company at 5 p.m., the deal was closed. Now this experience is related in detail here to illustrate the steps one takes to achieve his aims through the use of OPM. If you will refer to Chapter 11 entitled, Is There a Shortcut to Riches?, you will see how the principles mentioned there were applied here. While this story indicates how the use of OPM can help a person, Credit can sometimes be harmful. Warning. Credit can hurt you. So far, we have been talking about the benefits of the use of credit. We have been talking about the practice of borrowing money for the purpose of making money. This is capitalism. This is good. But that which is good can be harmful to a person with a negative mental attitude. Credit is no exception and credit may make a person who has been honest become dishonest. The abuse of credit is one of the main sources of worry, frustration, unhappiness, and dishonesty. Now we are talking about credit given voluntarily by a creditor. He gives credit to a person who he thinks has the quality of being worthy, on whose truthfulness he can rely. The one who betrays such a trust is dishonest. Such a person is the one who will borrow money or purchase merchandise without the intent to make the payments agreed upon or to pay the loan in full. Likewise, the honest person can become dishonest when he neglects to repay the loans he makes or pay for the merchandise he buys, even though circumstances may prevent him from making a payment on the due date. For the man under the influence of the PMA side of his talisman will have the courage to face the truth. He will have the courage to notify his creditors as far in advance as possible when circumstances prevent him from making a payment. And then he will work out some satisfactory arrangement by mutual consent with his creditor. Above everything else, he will sacrifice until his obligation is finally fully paid. The honest man with common sense does not abuse credit privileges. The honest man who lacks common sense will borrow or purchase on credit indiscriminately. And then, because he sees no way to pay his creditors, 
the NMA influence of his talisman exerts such a terrific force on him that he may become dishonest. He may feel his situation is hopeless, and he can do nothing about it. He realizes that he won't be thrown into jail for owing borrowed money. Although he thinks he is not going to be punished, in reality his worries, fears, and frustrations are a very real punishment. And he remains dishonest until he comes under the strong influences of the PMA side of his talisman, influences strong enough to cause him to clear his obligations in full. The abuse of credit privileges has literally brought on physical, mental, and moral illness. Remember Necessity, NMA, and Crime in Chapter 3, entitled, Clear the Cobwebs from Your Thinking. Warning, OPM and Cycles As a very young salesman in the early part of 1928, W. Clement Stone called on an officer at the Continental Illinois National Bank and Trust Company in Chicago. The banker was talking to a customer or friend. While the young salesman was waiting, he overheard him say, The market just can't keep going up forever. I'm selling my shares. Some of the keenest investors in the country lost fortunes when the stock market crashed the following year, all because they lacked the knowledge of cycles, or, if they had the knowledge, they, unlike the banker, failed to act. Tens of thousands of individuals engaging in all forms of business enterprises, including farming, lost their wealth, even though they were honest, prudent persons. Their wealth was acquired through OPM. As their securities increased in value, they borrowed more money to purchase more securities, farmland, or other assets. When the market value of their securities fell, they were unable to pay when the banks were forced to call in their loans. Cycles repeat with regularity, so in the first half of the 1970s, thousands of honest, prudent persons again lost their wealth because they didn't clear their loans in time by selling a portion of their securities, or didn't refrain from going further into debt to make additional purchases. When you use OPM, be certain to calculate how you can and will pay the individual or institution that loaned you the money. Important. If you have lost a portion or all of your wealth, remember that cycles repeat. Don't hesitate to start over again at the proper time. Many wealthy persons today lost fortunes previously. But because they didn't lose their PMA, they had the courage to learn from their experiences and subsequently acquired even greater wealth. If you would like to learn more about cycles, refer to Cycles, the Mysterious Forces That Trigger Events by Edward R. Dewey and Og Mandino. You may find it exceedingly profitable. You can keep abreast of the theories and experiments on cycles by reading Cycles Magazine, available online at cyclesmagazine.org. In business, there are very few numbers necessary in the combination to success, but if one or more of the numbers are missing, you will fail until you find the missing numbers. The use of other people's money has been the means whereby honest men who were poor became rich. Money or credit is an important number in the combination to business success. The Missing Number A young sales manager, whose yearly earnings are in excess of $35,000, wrote, I have a feeling, the type of feeling one would have if he were standing in front of a safe which held all the wealth, happiness, and success in the world and he had all the numbers to the combination except one. Just one number. If he had it, he could open the door. Often the difference between poverty and wealth lies in the employment of all principles in a formula but one. Just that one missing number makes the difference. This can be illustrated in the experience of another man who had been successful in selling cosmetics for a manufacturer before he went into business for himself. In his own business, Leonard Lavin, like any man who starts from the bottom, was faced with problems. As you will see later, that was good. It was good because he had to study, think, plan, and work hard before he found a solution to each problem. Bernice, his wife, and he formed a perfect mastermind alliance, and they worked together in perfect harmony. They manufactured one cosmetic item, 
and acted as distributors for other companies. But they lacked working capital, so they were forced to do the work themselves. As their business grew, Bernice became an expert in office management and purchasing, and an excellent administrator. Leonard became a successful sales manager and efficient production manager. And when the business grew, they were wise enough to employ the services of a lawyer with good common sense, the kind that gets things done. And they also benefited from the services of an expert in accounting and taxes. The way to make a fortune is to manufacture or sell a product or service, preferably a necessity at a low cost, that repeats. They did both. Every dollar that could be spared was plowed back into the business. Necessity motivated them to study, think, and plan. Make one dollar do the part of many. Obtain maximum results from every working hour. Eliminate waste. Month by month, their sales moved forward as Leonard aggressively sought to break each previous sales record. He became known in the industry as a man who knew his business. To many, he became known as a man who learned to go the extra mile. Going the extra mile in two instances completely changed the course of his career for the better. In the one instance, his banker introduced him to three of the bank's clients who had made an investment in another cosmetic company. They needed expert advice from someone with good common sense, and Leonard took the time to help them. Leonard went the extra mile in doing a good turn for a buyer in a drugstore in Los Angeles. And then one day, the buyer showed his appreciation by confidentially informing Leonard that the firm manufacturing VO5, a quality hairdressing, might be for sale. Leonard got excited, for here was a 15-year-old company with a quality product that had leveled off. He knew from his cosmetic experience and from the study of cycles and trends that all this company needed was new life, new blood, new activity. He acted on the self-starter, do it now. In fact, that very evening he was in conference with the owner. Now, ordinarily in a transaction of this type where the buyer and seller don't know each other, it takes weeks and sometimes months to negotiate before there is a meeting of the minds. A pleasing personality and good common sense on the part of the buyer or seller often eliminate unnecessary delays. Because of Leonard's pleasing personality and his good common sense, the owner agreed to sell the company for $400,000 that same night. Now it is true that Leonard had been doing well, but it was also true that every dollar he could spare was being plowed back into his business. Where could he get $400,000? In his hotel room that night, he realized that he had all of the combinations to real wealth, but one, just one, money. The next morning, as he awakened, he had a flash of inspiration. Again, he reacted to the self-starter, do it now. For he made a long-distance telephone call to one of the three men to whom he was introduced by his banker. He had helped them, and perhaps they could give him the right advice. For they knew more about financing than he. Because they had invested in another cosmetic company, perhaps they would invest in his. They did. And because these men were experienced in investing, they employed a successful investment formula which made it necessary for Leonard to agree to A. Consolidate all his operations. B. Devote his entire efforts to one corporation. C. Have the corporation pay back the loan on quarterly installments over a five-year period. D. Pay at the going rate of interest on the loan. And E. Give 25% of the corporation's stock as a premium for the investment gamble. Leonard did agree. He saw the value of the use of OPM. The three men used OPM too. They borrowed the $400,000 from their banks. The missing number... Now Leonard and Bernice had it. They worked long hours. They put their hearts into the business. They found it a thrilling game. It wasn't long before VO5 was being used in every part of the United States and in many foreign countries. December is usually the slowest month of the year for the cosmetic manufacturer. But in December, a year and a half after Leonard and Bernice took over the management of VO5, 
and another product which was acquired, Rinseaway. The factory had a dollar volume of more than $870,000. That was as much as VO5 and Rinseaway together had received during their past years under previous management. And Bernice and Leonard found the missing number. With it, they found the combination to acquire wealth. For it was only three years after the acquisition of VO5 that their equities in their company were valued in excess of a million dollars. Now, the numbers in Leonard Lavin's combination for success were, number one, a product or service that repeats. Number two, a company that is making money with an exclusive product or trade name, but which is leveled off. Number three, a good experienced production manager who operates the factory with maximum efficiency. Number four, a successful experienced sales manager who constantly increases sales at a profit to the company by adhering to a successful sales formula and simultaneously seeking better sales methods. Number five, a good administrator with PMA. Number six, an expert accountant who understands cost accounting and income tax law. Number seven, a good lawyer with common sense and PMA who gets things done. Number eight, sufficient working capital or credit to operate the business and expand it at the right time. You too can use OPM for business. It is quite simple. It is other people's money. Now, if you choose to learn the principles in this chapter, as well as those in chapter 12 entitled Attract, Don't Repel Wealth, you, like Leonard and Bernice Lavin, can find the missing numbers to unlock the door to riches for yourself. But to be healthy and happy, you must find satisfaction in your job. When you listen to the next chapter, you will learn how. Pilot number 13. Thoughts to Steer By 1. Business? It is quite simple. It is other people's money. 2. OPM other people's money is the way to acquire wealth. 3. The basic unwritten premise in Use OPM is Operate on the highest ethical standards of integrity, honor, honesty, loyalty, consent, and the golden rule. 4. The dishonest man is not entitled to credit. 5. Your banker is your friend. 6. Where there is nothing to lose by trying and a great deal to gain if successful, by all means try. 7. When you want to make a deal with someone, develop a plan that will give him what he wants, and in doing so, get what you want. A good deal is mutually advantageous. 8. Credit used indiscriminately can hurt you. Abuse of credit is the cause of much frustration, misery, and dishonesty. 9. To unlock the combination to success, you must know all the necessary numbers. Just one missing number may keep you from achieving your goal. 10. You too can find the missing numbers and unlock the door to riches for yourself. 11. Learn about cycles in order to know when to expand and when to make and pay off loans. Have the courage to face the truth. Chapter 14. How to Find Satisfaction in Your Job No matter what your job may be, boss or employee, plant manager or factory worker, doctor or nurse, lawyer or secretary, teacher or student, housewife or maid, you owe it to yourself to find satisfaction in your job as long as you have it. You can, you know. Satisfaction is a mental attitude. Your own mental attitude is the one thing you possess over which you alone have complete control. You can determine to find satisfaction in your job and discover the way to do so. You are more apt to find satisfaction in your job if you do what comes naturally, that for which you have a natural aptitude or liking. When you take a job that doesn't come naturally, you may experience mental and emotional conflicts and frustrations. You can, however, neutralize and eventually overcome such conflicts and frustrations if you use PMA, 
and if you are motivated to gain experience to become proficient in the job. Jerry Assam has PMA, and Jerry Assam loves his work. He finds satisfaction in his job. Who is Jerry Assam? What does he do? Jerry is a descendant of the Hawaiian kings. The job he loves so much is that of sales manager for the Hawaiian office of a large organization. Jerry loves his work because he knows his work well and is very proficient in it. Thus, he is doing what comes naturally. But even so, Jerry has days when things could be a little rosier. In sales work, days like this can be disturbing. If one does not study, think, and plan to correct difficulties and to maintain a positive mental attitude. So Jerry reads inspirational self-help action books. Jerry had read such inspirational books and learned very important lessons. 1. You can control your mental attitude by the use of self-motivators. 2. If you set a goal, you are more apt to recognize things that will help you achieve it than if you don't set a goal. And the higher you set your goal, the greater will be your achievement if you have PMA. 3. To succeed in anything, it is necessary to know the rules and understand how to apply them. It is necessary to engage in constructive thinking, study, learning, and planning time with regularity. Jerry believed these lessons. He got into action. He tried them out himself. He studied his company's sales manuals and practiced what he learned in actual selling. He set his goals, high goals, and achieved them. And each morning he said to himself, I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific. And he did feel healthy, happy, and terrific. And his sales results were terrific too. When Jerry was sure he himself was proficient in his sales work, he gathered about himself a group of salesmen and taught them the lessons he had learned. He trained the men in the latest and best-selling methods as set forth in his company's training manuals. He took them out personally and demonstrated how easy it is to sell if one uses the right methods, has a plan, and approaches each day with a positive mental attitude. He taught them to set high sales goals and to achieve them with PMA. Every morning, Jerry's group meets and recites enthusiastically in unison, I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific. Then they laugh together, slap one another on the back for good luck, and each one goes his way to sell his quota for the day. Each man sets a goal, and he sets it so high that older, more experienced salesmen and sales managers on the mainland are amazed. At the end of each week, Every salesman turns in a sales report that makes the president and sales manager of Jerry's organization smile big, broad smiles. Are Jerry and the men under him happy and satisfied in their jobs? You bet they are. And here are some of the reasons they are happy. 1. They have studied their work well. They know and understand the rules and techniques and how to apply them so well that what they are doing comes naturally to them. 2. They set their goals regularly, and they believe they will make them. They know that what the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve with PMA. 3. They keep a positive mental attitude continually by using self-motivators. 4. They enjoy the satisfaction that comes with a job well done. I feel healthy. I feel happy. I feel terrific. Another young salesman in the same organization on the mainland learned to control his mental attitude through the use of Jerry Assam's self-motivator. He was an 18-year-old college student who was working during his summer vacation selling insurance on a cold canvas basis in stores and offices. Some of the things he had learned during his theoretical training period were 1. The habits that a salesman develops within the first two weeks after leaving the sales school will follow him throughout his career. 2. When you have a sales target, keep trying until you hit it. 3. Aim higher. 4. In your moment of need, use self-motivators such as I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific, 
to motivate yourself to positive action in the desired direction. After he had a few weeks selling experience, he set a specific target of achievement. He aimed to win an award. To qualify, it was necessary to make a minimum of 100 sales in a single week. By Friday night of that week, he had succeeded in making 80 sales, 20 short of his target. The young salesman was determined that nothing would stop him from achieving his objective. He believed what he had been taught. What the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve with PMA. Although the other salesmen in his group closed their week's work on Friday night, he was back on the job early Saturday morning. By three o'clock in the afternoon, he hadn't made a sale. He had been taught that sales are contingent upon the attitude of the salesman, not the prospect. He remembered the Jerry Assam self-motivator and repeated it five times with enthusiasm. I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific. About five o'clock that afternoon, he had made three sales. He was only 17 from his goal. He remembered that success is achieved by those who try and maintained by those who keep trying with PMA. Again, he repeated several times with enthusiasm, I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific. About 11 o'clock that night, he was tired, but he was happy. He had made his 20th sale for the day. He had hit his target. He had won the award and learned that failure can be turned to success by keeping on trying.